Well, so far for the mod videos, we've taken a look at some level editing, some ship editing, and a game mod itself. So, when are we going to do some actual modding work? Well, probably never. The process of modding a game requires delving into the depths of its machine code and data files, trying to figure out how it does everything it's capable of, and that's simply not a topic that can be gone over easily or succinctly. So today for ADG Mod, we're going to do the next best thing with the old driving game Stunts, aka 40 Sports Driving, by trying to figure out exactly how the track file format works so that anyone so inclined can effortlessly make their own track editor, as well as to see if we can find any hidden objects or map making possibilities that are otherwise impossible to accomplish using the game's built-in track editor. Also, to answer the question of why anyone would bother making a track editor for a game which already has one built in, there's actually several out there. The built-in editor for stunts is, quite frankly, not very good. And even though it's simple, it can also be clunky and awkward, not to mention can miss keystrokes every once in a while, causing you to ultimately do things you didn't intend to do. And while it does also technically have mouse support, it's handled very poorly. But all things considered, it's just plain better to use an external editor if you're serious about making tracks for this game. So the first thing we're going to do is open the default.trk file in a hex editor to see if the data is encrypted in any way or if it's stored without any obfuscation at all. Now the fact that the file size is only 1802 bytes is a good sign, as the tracks are 30 by 30 tiles large, which equates to 900 tiles per track, and 1800 is 900 times 2, which would make sense as we have both the track pieces and the landscape. Now sure enough, upon opening the track file in a hex editor, we see that it is very much plain as day. The way it seems to be laid out is to start with the track piece data and then follow it up with the landscape data. But something seems... Uh, off. To get a better idea of things, I've gone into stunts and I'm making a very simple track that just consists of crossovers all around the borders and elevated landscape underneath. Now, stunts itself will never let you drive on a track like this, but you're allowed to save any track in any state, so we can still save this and look at it externally. Now, sure enough, in the hex editor, we see that byte 4a equals the crossovers we used, 00, 0 represents a blank space, and elevated landscape is equal to a byte value of 06. But more pertinently, though, we see an extra byte in use between the track data and landscape data. Now, this is the scenery byte. Now, normally, this is only supposed to range between 00, 0 and 04 for the first five different scenery possibilities. So, just as an experiment, let's see what happens if we set it to 05. As expected, the game crashed, but there was an interesting error message, .esh file error. Now, when you go looking through the stunts directory, you're not going to find any .esh files. And it stands to reason that esh was the file extension used for the scenery files before they were compiled, and that with a properly named and formatted file, it might be possible to create additional scenery. But then perhaps not. And that's a bit more complex than I want to get into with this video, so let's just shift our focus back to the tracks again. The one other thing to note is that every single track file ends with a 00, zero byte that just seems to be there for seemingly no reason. Though I'm going to guess there is a reason, I just don't know what it is. Modifying it on a completed track didn't seem to do anything when loading or playing said track. So next thing we should do is figure out what all the valid byte values are. Now to do this, we're going to write as many track pieces down onto a single track as we can, and then load that up in the hex editor. In fact, there's 10 6x6 pages of pieces, which only equates to 360 tiles of space out of a 900 tiles large track. So we can fit everything onto a single track. And I'm also aligning everything to match the pages themselves for simplicity's sake. I also put down a special section to investigate if the byte values change for certain pieces, which appear differently when they're placed on top of inclines. After saving the track and loading it up in the hex editor, I got a bit of a surprise. The track object tiles, but not the landscape tiles, are stored flipped on the y-axis. The bottom row is stored first, from the leftmost tile to the rightmost, then it goes up row by row until reaching the top row. The landscape, however, is stored as expected, starting at the top left corner, going through an entire row to the right, then down row by row until reaching the bottom right corner. But we got another interesting piece of info too. Tiles placed on inclines do not have different values compared to when they're placed on flat land. Well, this is pertinent because the model data loaded is absolutely different for these tiles. So both the track tile and the landscape tile beneath factor into which 3D model is used. 
Another interesting thing of note is how it's handling multi-tile track pieces. Now, the top left corner of the tile contains the actual tile value, keeping in mind that when viewed in the hex editor, here it's the bottom left corner. Now extended horizontally, the additional tile is given a byte value of FF, extended vertically, the additional tile gets a byte value of FE, and for 2x2 two two pieces, the opposite corner gets a byte value of FD. Now, this raises an interesting question as to if the game can properly process tracks if these byte values are missing or changed. To test this, I put together a track where I intended to have a small corner embedded into the empty space of a large corner. But of course the track editor won't let me do this, as the tiles cannot intersect each other in any way. But there isn't anything stopping me from doing this in the hex editor. Now, after using the hex editor to alter the track to have the small corner inside the larger corner, I went back into stunts, reloaded the track, and... Oh jeez, did that actually work? Well, let's go test the track. Yeah, it's even letting me start driving on the track. And normally if there's an issue with the track, it'll pull up the editor when you try to drive on it, but this is just letting me go at it. Now, the drive doesn't go perfectly though. There does seem to be a conflict in terms of what track piece the engine wants to render in that moment, but it's definitely there and being processed as though it were there, even if it's not being rendered perfectly, as I'm able to drive a full lap around the course without issue. Needless to say, trying to load the track in the editor following, it completely forgets one of those track tiles was there, and upon leaving the editor, yeah, still missing. Suffice to say, any track edited together like this works, but will break the moment the editor tries to handle it. Let's take this up a notch though, by having two large turns face together with crossroads at the points that they meet at. Now again, the editor won't allow this to be made, but using the hex editor, we can make it happen. And sure enough, the game loads and processes this track just fine. In fact, because the space shared is empty on both large tiles, this one renders perfectly fine too. Now, even going into the replay and looking from a distance, it's rendering as expected. But again, going into the editor following completely breaks it. Now, there is going to be some limitations to doing this. And for starters, the empty space on this particular large curve is the defining tile, so we can't overwrite it and still have a valid large tile since the extended parts don't hold any data, merely placeholder bytes. Plus, we still have to consider that we want the track to be winnable, so we can't really overwrite the spots where there's actual connections to the track and end up with something that makes sense. In any case, this is what the compiled table of hex values ended up looking like. Well, it's a lot of data for sure, and this image alone is going to be amazingly useful for anyone who wants to make their own editor, so I'll have a link to it in the video description for anyone else who wants to use it. But I was wondering what this info itself could tell us about the pieces that we have access to. So I put together a grid of all 256 byte values and started lighting up each byte that was used by a track piece and ended up with this. So this looks mostly normal, but very curiously, there's a gap in the byte values as 02 and 03 don't appear to be used by any of the track pieces at all. And as for the normal pieces, they go all the way up to B5, making a gap between B6 and FC, which might have stuff hidden within, though it isn't likely. In any event, we're going to test all of this. I created a basic array of landscape pieces, and the plan is to cover them with the track piece byte values of 0, 02 and 0, 03. But upon doing so, it didn't seem to do anything. But upon loading the track in the editor, it appears that values of 0, 02 and 0, 03 are just blank grass tiles, although treated like track pieces. I can't say there'd be much use for such a thing, but it's good to know about this anyways. I next proceeded to repeat the landscape entirely, and then in the hex editor threw a whole bunch of invalid byte values on top of all this. I then went to reload the track, and uh, yeah, if this were a real computer, it would have either hard locked something fierce or completely reset. Whoops. Well, I tried again with fewer byte values, just the first bit past what seemed to be the limit, and this time the track not only loaded, but it appears that the byte values beyond the normal limit reference the alternate models used for the inclines, though some weird stuff was happening with the byte values past those as well. In the editor, most of this got nulled out, but some of it remained and it ended up pulling graphics from the mask data for the sprites. Plus, if I tried to highlight any of them, yep, game wasn't having any of that. Not surprising really, but I wanted to test it all the same. The last thing I wanted to check though was inclines, plus I wanted to see if I could get the large turns to cut across the angled landscape corners. 
So I made a long elevated strip, laid some track around it, which intersected some water, but that's fine, I can test that too. Then using the hex editor, plopped a bunch of pieces onto the inclines which shouldn't be there, and finished the track loop that the editor wouldn't let me make. Now upon loading the track back up, it was apparent that the corners of the elevated platform ended up getting chopped off from the turns, and literally all of the track pieces it wouldn't let me put on an incline just ended up becoming nothing. But well, wait a minute, is the track on the water perfectly okay? This called for some more testing. Now I went back to the file I originally created to figure out all the hex values and flooded it with water using the hex editor. Now upon loading it back up in the game itself, well, pretty much all of the track tiles were able to go over top of the water just fine, as long as they only took up a single tile. And for some reason, extended tiles such as large turns, loops, and those spiral elevation circles, they left grass over top of where the extended parts of the tiles were, even though water showed up under the tiles which actually defined what was supposed to be there. I couldn't race on that track though, so I put a quick little track together which would normally be totally valid on its own, but then using the hex editor, I completely flooded the inner area with water. Now upon reloading the track in the game, well, it's completely flooded and all the track tiles were still in place and perfectly okay. And yes, it let me drive on this. Naturally, I went all around the course to test that everything was working fine, and sure enough it was. Completed a lap and got a high score. But now the bigger question was if the water was actually still doing its job. So I decided to drive a bit more sloppy and oh yeah, water is definitely still doing its job. <laughs> Having the water right beneath the track means if you stray off to the side too far, you're going down. Although there does seem to be some leeway here, just barely scraping the edge of the water isn't enough to trigger a drowning. Although, in all honesty, I actually already knew this particular aspect of external editing was possible, as it's frequently used in competitive tracks to prevent illegal cutting across the course, as the game is not extraordinarily picky about this, only mildly picky. Either way, as you probably would have expected, the instant I attempt to load the track in the built-in editor, it completely vanishes from on top of the water. Of course, we can just reload it again if it hasn't been saved, and ping, track is back. So, what have we learned? Well, we now have a chart showing every single hexadecimal track tile value, both the standard pieces and the landscape pieces. We know how the track is stored in its file. We know that cutting into the extended parts of the tiles does not necessarily break them, but can cause rendering glitches in certain circumstances. And that the restriction of placing things on water is only enforced by the editor, and that the game can otherwise handle any single tile objects on top of water perfectly fine. With this information in hand, not only could you make your own external editor should you desire, but chances are it'd be a zillion times more usable than the one in stunts itself, and you can make it in such a way that permits the things that we've seen here that the built-in editor does not. Actually, part of the reason I wanted to make this video is because I once tried to make my own stunts editor. I didn't get any coding done, but got fairly far into the creation of the graphics, as you can see on screen now. Never finished the graphics though, as I started getting held up by some of the more complex objects, seeing as I was going for an isometric look. And I'm also not opposed to someday making a spiritual successor to stunts capable of loading the old stunts track files, but as it stands, I have other projects I want to do first. Besides, there's already a project in the works to remake stunts called Ultimate Stunts, which I'll have a link for in the video description. Though in all honesty, initial impressions weren't good, mainly because it's difficult to set up, the UI is very bare bones, and the physics still kind of felt a bit off. It's still under development though, so those are definitely things which will likely be addressed in the future. Anywho, that's all for this episode of ADG Mod. Next episode of Ancient DOS Games, episode 258, will be on Saturday, August 3rd, and we're going to be taking a look at a game which came in one of the most strangest shaped boxes ever. Not that I have the box, just the disc, but hey, that's good enough, so make sure to stay tuned to see what the game itself is like. Thanks for watching, everyone, and extra special thanks to everyone supporting me on Patreon. Here's just a small selection of you guys.